Ostracods are remarkable creatures in that they are uh, very abundant, uh, almost ubiquitous in deposits of ancient lakes, uh, and they're very sensitive markers for changing ecological and environmental conditions. So they're an ideal tool for us when we're trying to reconstruct uh, both environmental character in the past and the way in which it's changed over time. Ostracods are uh, bivalved crustaceans, so in, it's very much like putting a tiny shrimp inside of a clamshell, uh, but then scaling it down to where it's about a millimeter in length, so they're very, very tiny. Uh, and in the fossil record, we primarily get the outer shells and the, uh, the appendages and the body of the organism are soft body parts and they don't preserve, but the shells preserve very well in the fossil record. I'm a geologist and I've worked in Africa for a little over 30 years, uh, mostly in northern Kenya, investigating the past environments of the Turkana Basin. The Turkana Basin has a long and varied history which is very well recorded in the layers of rocks around modern Lake Turkana. And so we can go through over four million years of human history uh, in the fossil record of hominid ancestors themselves, in the stone tools that record their culture, uh, as well as the fossils of all of the creatures that belonged with them in the savanna landscape. Lake Turkana is a large Rift Valley lake, and that lake and the area that drains around it is roughly the size of the state of New Jersey. My name is Kat Beck and I am a PhD student at Rutgers University. I've been here since the fall of 2009 uh, when I came to do a master's project with Dr. Craig Feibel. The ostracods that we're working with in the lab right now from the HSPDP project come from a series or a, a long core that was drilled in the summer of 2013. And this is a big production, drilling a long core like this, because it involves trekking tons of equipment up from Nairobi and up from Mombasa, the seaports, up to the Turkana Basin on some very dicey roads. When the core is recovered for our cores, because the sediment was relatively soft, we collect them within PVC tubes. So these are long three meter uh, plastic tubes that the core is actually collected in. We seal off the ends, bring, bring it back in, in segments back to the U.S. And so when we get them to the laboratory, these have to be split open in order to access the material. Uh, and so what we do is simply put them onto a saw, uh, which can cut the core lengthwise, split it open into two halves. Uh, and at that stage, we identify one half as the archival half that will be kept as a record of everything that we found. Uh, and the other half, which is the working half, which we'll do sampling uh, and various measurements on. This was the deepest record ever drilled from the Turkana Basin, and the core itself wasn't coming from the center of the lake. We weren't on a boat when we were drilling, but we were on land in an area that used to be covered by the lake about two million years ago. So we subsampled the core in Minneapolis at the Lac Core Repository and shipped home to the laboratory here uh, a series of small samples, about 550 in total, uh, that were small, several cubic centimeter sized uh, subsamples collected throughout the core. Uh, initially what we did was to freeze dry those samples so that we would have dry weights and be able to relate all of our analysis to, to the mass of material that we were working from. Uh, and then uh, the, the samples were split and a portion of that was washed uh, just with distilled water uh, through a series of sieves, which is simply a means of separating the material into sized fractions. Um, because ostracods, like many other organisms, have a finite size range in the adult form, uh, we know which size particles we're looking for to get the adult ostracods. Uh, and so we separate that out uh, remove all of the finer grain material uh, and then we simply dry it uh, and examine it under a binocular microscope. 
At that stage, we do a preliminary screen to see the diversity and abundance of ostracods, as well as other materials that may come out in the same size fractions, including charcoal particles, uh, bits and pieces of fish, uh, and anything else that may be sort of the same size range. Occasionally some mineral grains, but mostly it's uh, biological materials. Uh, at that stage, we decide whether there's enough material and whether it's well enough preserved that we want to count uh, the diversity and abundance of everything in the sample or simply record sort of presence, absence of different components within the, within the sample. Uh, we'll also subsample some of the taxa so that we can do chemical and isotopic analysis, uh, remove some of the best preserved specimens for uh, imaging on the scanning electron microscope, uh, and any other analyses that we, we may want to do. One of the interesting things that we have come across thus far with our ostracods is we see a great deal of morphological variability even within uh, one particular genera or genus. And so what this tells us is that we have more diverse populations than what we see in the modern. And this is really interesting because we don't know a lot about old ostracods, ancient ostracods, if you will. And so everything we learn is sort of a new opportunity to learn more about these ecosystems and these organisms. And that's very exciting. Ostracods in themselves give you a part of the story, but where the power of those records comes in is when you combine them with multiple records to make a multi-proxy study of a basin. The ostracods are very good at telling us things about like the salinity of the water or the pH of the water and also the turbidity of the water column. So we can see both directly what the water is like and then also what might be influencing the system. So one source of turbidity would be input, fluvial input, so input coming in from rivers in the form of suspended sediment. So if we see ostracods that don't like turbidity in an area, then we probably know there's not a lot of local discharge coming into the basin. Science allows you to investigate puzzles, uh, to, to look for answers where there's a complex set of clues, but very often you don't have all of the information uh, to get a simple answer. And so it becomes a real challenge to try to work out uh, the answer to a particular puzzle. For our particular project, the, the goal is to provide a record of environmental character and how it changes through time for this half million or so year period, uh, and to provide it in a close proximity to uh, the fossil localities and archaeological sites so that we can directly link characteristics of the environment, and particularly things like climate change, to the fossil and archaeological record. The ultimate outcome from this research on the cores from the Turkana Basin would be to increase our understanding of the paleo environment and the paleo climate during the past, well, from about 2 million to 1.4 million years, which is the interval of time spanned by the sedimentary record. And this understanding the paleo environment and paleo climate is essential because during this time we see some very key transitions in hominid evolution and we are looking for whether or not there are environmental or um, climatic drivers to these changes. And so by looking at sort of the large scale stratigraphy we can start to put all of our individual proxies including ostracods into a broader context and to apply them to this big picture goal of paleoenvironmental reconstruction. The record that we get from the fossil ostracods speaks of the range of changes that have occurred in the past. Uh, and very often one of the things that we find from the fossil record is that the environmental fluctuations of the past were quite dramatic. Uh, and so in many cases, the sorts of environmental change, the range of variability, and the consequences of particular environmental events uh, have records from the ancient past. Uh, and once we can recognize uh, this, the associations of these, very often they will help us to better understand uh, the, the way in which events may unfold in the future as global change occurs.